my deep capacity to be empathetic and grateful, which transforms in what most people see is somebody who markets. But in the way I navigate my life and the way that I market to the end consumer, my unbelievable opportunity to speak in front of this crowd today is predicated on listening. I talk, you listen to my podcast, I interrupt every single person that is on my show because I've already heard what they said and I just want to move it along and we don't f edit. It seems mean, it seems audacious, it's deeply based on listening. We have to start the process of listening to the youth. They're telling us the answers. You just care what your neighbor thinks about your kid. You just care about what your mother thinks about your kid. You just care about what your sister thinks about your kid. You need to start listening to your kid. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because in my first business, I struggled to believe in myself. I quit on my business partner. And the thing that saved me was watching the successful stories of entrepreneurs. They gave me the inspiration to keep going, as well as the strategies of what to do. And quite honestly, I still need their stories and motivation today as well. So today, this one from one of the best, Gary Vaynerchuk, and my take on his top 50 rules for success. Enjoy. On social, I watch so many kids that I'm looking at, watching them progress, have a terrible game, throw four picks, delete their shit. Delete it. G hit me up on DM. I'm gonna, Gary Vee, I'm gonna detox off Insta. I know we've been talking, but like off this, this game last week, I'm done. I'm coming back in October. And I always think about that shit. And we all have to figure out our relationship with technology. But here's how I take it from my purview. I think people get too high when they get cheered. I think the reason people struggle when people shit on them in comments is because they're taking other people's opinions way too serious. The best way to be able to help take care of and deal with people shit on you is not getting too high when they're giving you accolades. When I watch videos like that, when people give, right now I'm on that place where I get so much love, I, I don't hear them. I really don't. I understand, I appreciate it, feels humbling as fuck, you know, but I don't hear them. I still think I suck, I'm grinding, I'm in the process, it's early. Which is why when people shit on me, and they do, a lot, because when you're out there like that, that's just how it is, I can't hear them either. And so one thing, one thing I would consider is actually using social media's negativity and judgment as an ability to actually absorb it, create a framework where you can actually accept both pros and cons at scale instead of running away from it. Every time I see somebody shutting down and deleting, I get nervous because I don't see it as a detox for 99% of the people I talk to. I see it running away from judgment. And judgment is the only thing I promise you that you'll have for the rest of your life and that you have had. I believe in work ethic like nobody's business. I believe that work ethic is an enormous variable of success. You just, I, and controllable which is powerful. However, my, you know, through the years, what I've not done a, as good of a job, though I've sprinkled it, though I've done unique pieces of content about it, though my second book was called The Thank You Economy, though in my first book, Crush It, I speak about this. The reason this is a very easy answer for me is the way you sustain it is loving it. It doesn't become being a workaholic when you're doing your hobby. The reason I started telling people that any, the reason I, you know, when people hear anybody can do it, they're like, ah, Gary, this is the secret you, it's, I'm like, no, no, take a step back. We now live in an internet world where the cost of entry is zero, and every one of us who's listening right now has a passion, whether that's fishing, fashion, hair coloring, drinking wine, sport. I believe that anybody can start the process of creating content around something they're passionate about which will always do better than something you're not passionate about and that over time that may lead to something that can pay you 30, 40, 80,000 euros or dollars a year or eventually millions if you're ultimately talented. If you're sitting here right now and you're real, real passionate about something that doesn't have to do with the four walls we're in right now, you need to lean into that because that's the thing the internet's doing the amount of people that can make a real living around having a podcast or a vlog or flipping shit they love versus getting a job they hate and they can make as much or around the same much around having a 
podcast around Fortnite versus going and working in finance because they interned this summer in Wall Street and they think that's where the money is, that sh- I know nobody here believes, but I've been saying it for a decade and I'm watching it every day and it's real. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business I'll see you there when me and my dad started having too much friction because I was getting the credit and became the man and he was so when did that happen that happened probably seven eight years into me running the business okay where it was like Gary not Sasha right and then that, because my, my dad's an alpha and his pride he came to this country with nothing hundred dollars right. in his pocket and built something but then I took it to such an extreme level that it was friction, and I was like, F- this, man, I'm not gonna f- not have a relationship with my dad. Mm-hmm. My brother was graduating college, I was like, F- it, let's start something new. So the truth is, it wasn't that I woke up and I was like, wine's whack, or I, I wanna do something else. It was that like, m- I just wanted to like, have a real relationship with my dad, and I was starting to like, get really worried. And so did that start like an addictive process in which you just kept having to like, move on to bigger and bigger things? I don't know if it's that. I think uh, from my standpoint, you know, the answer I gave to you, I eat my own dog food. Like, straight up, like, I deploy patience. Like, I didn't think twice that at 34, I didn't have a whole lot of money. I built my dad's business for him. I was leaving with nothing. Really? Nothing? Nothing. I, didn't, I don't own anything from Wine Library. It's, I love when people leave comments like, oh, f- this guy, his, you know, his dad gave him a $4 million store. I'm like, no, no, no. I built my dad's business for him mm-hmm. to a totally different level. He gave me life and gave me the opportunity to build his store for him. But at 34 years old, I'm worth d- zero. So what do you do from there? I f- get some guy to pay us $80,000 to be a VaynerMedia client. I get Mike Boyd to f- work for free and sleep on the floor. We f- grinded. And seven years later, we have a $150 million business. And uh, I just f- worked. I grew up in an environment where my dad worked every minute to try to make it in the new world and he eventually owned a liquor store in New Jersey. I was dragged into that when I was 14. And really from day one, um, I started doing two things that are interesting to me. I started doing a lot of UI, UX, which in, in the way I would say that was I started moving my dad's store around. I used to stand behind the register and it wasn't that busy, right? Like, you know, you know it, where I could watch almost every customer walk in and where would they go and what would they buy and intuitive as 14, I would understand like why do we send them that way where we sell stuff that's not as expensive as over here. Like really in hind, you know, a lot of this stuff in the last five years I've recalled. Even Lemonade, when I was six years old, Instead of standing behind my own lemonade stands, I got my friends to do it because I would literally walk up and down the streets of New Jersey watching cars drive by to try to figure out what tree or what post to put a sign on. So I've been truly intuitively chasing attention my whole life. As a matter of fact, that's gonna bubble up in a minute. One of the biggest reasons I push against television advertising and think it's grossly overpriced and overrated is not because I don't believe in the craft or a 30 second video, it's that I don't believe people are consuming them. You know, like that, that, I think that needs to matter. You could literally make the greatest thing of all time. It's kind of like the tree in the forest. Like, you're gonna spend nine months making something that nobody sees? Seems like a waste of time. To me, it's something that I'm pushing more clarity around, which is, I want you to be happy. And I, accountable. Of co- well, the beauty of entrepreneurship is without, there is, it's inherently ac- accountability. Otherwise it fails. I do want people to be happy and I actually think accountability leads to happiness. When you think the government's in charge, the, the media's in charge, Facebook's in charge, this boss is in charge, when you believe somebody else is in charge of your life, you immediately start the process of unhappiness. Accountability is the framework of happiness. It doesn't mean bad things aren't happening. It's not delusion to the macro injustices of the world. It's called accountability. My failures are funny because I'm an immigrant, so I've always got, I never do 
that's like gonna put me totally out of business. I always got a nest egg, I'm always on like third and a half bait. Like I'm never doing something that's like over the edge and if this looks up, it's like you know? My biggest mistakes have been the things I haven't done. I referenced it real quick. If you go read my first book in 2008, Crush It, 2008, I thank my family and one random person, Travis Kalkinick, who went on to start Uber, who used to, when me and AJ started VaynerMedia, used to fly around like in Vegas and and just hang out with us because he had no job, he was in between. Starts Uber, I'm investing like crazy on everything. He asked me to invest in Uber twice and I said no. Because I just bought an apartment, I was a little less liquid, I thought it was a side project for him. I also thought Uber was like a rich man's game. Like it was originally like a limo on your phone. So I was like, you know, how big is that gonna be? And I passed twice. We got in a little bit later, you know, so we did all right. But, but I mean, I le- I mean, if I wrote my normal $50,000, $25,000 check, I probably left in the ballpark of 300 to 800 million on the table. So that's an L. <laughs> and on some real sh- like, I don't even feel it because what I've started to really learn about myself in the last year or so is I'm about the process, not the trophies. I'm just about the process. I love my game. I love my game so much. I wanna win, I'd like to have that W, but uh, money's funny, right? Like anybody who doesn't have it thinks it's the key to happiness and they're super confused and then they say, well easy for you to say you, you have it. And I was like, yo, I didn't have it for a long ass time. I lived in the villas in Springfield Avenue in Springfield in a apartment until I was 28, buying nothing, making 40, 50,000 a year, working 90 hours a week in a liquor store. So I've tasted both. So I made a lot of mistakes. I pass on all sorts of shit. I just don't know what the mistakes are because I say no so much because I'm so busy. What if that one meeting was with, you know? Make a lot of mistakes. I'm trying to get so much done in the 18 hours, 19 hours that I'm awake that to me every second matters and if I can hack it, like I'm gonna do it. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of not spending time on the shit that doesn't matter or the stuff I'm not good at. Mm-hmm. But I'll spend three hours reading every comment because I'm good at looking at it and synthesizing it and then understanding what the fuck is going on. Right. And so I think people think there's some smart way to do it. The smart way to do it, everybody, is to figure out what the fuck you're good at, quadruple down on that shit, and punt everything else. My ambition 10 years ago stays true today. I want to buy some of the most nostalgic brands that have ever existed when the next economy collapses. So when this economy finally collapses, I want to go buy Kit Kats, Bubblicious, K-Swiss, you know, Ralph Lauren, I want to buy brands and then I want to be the CEO of it. And what I knew then was I understood small businesses, I understood Silicon Valley, I didn't understand Fortune 500 businesses. But I wasn't gonna go get a job, so I decided to start the agency because at that point I realized marketing was my superpower. Hanging out with all those Silicon Valley titans, why was I invited to the dinner? Why were they listening to me? It's because they were great at tech, but I really understood. One of the biggest reasons Forget about the current way people view Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg's deep understanding of human psyche was the number one reason we connected. I think I'm an extremely good marketer because I think this entire thing that we're at right now is an internal B2B ecosystem and the only thing I pay attention to is the end consumer. I know so little about what's going on here this is, this is literally the first three years I was here, I only did this event. I didn't know anything else. You guys remember, I don't, I st- Harriet just joined us to run comms from BBDO, she's incredible. I'm still asking her on the way here. She's like, we were fi- final list, what's it called? Shortlist. shortlist. She's like, we were shortlisted for a bunch of stuff today. I'm like, I don't even know, the, I, I literally thought it was final list. Like I still, do, Adam, yesterday we won a silver thing and I was like, what does that mean? Like I still am so, deeply unaware of what's happening here, not out of audacity, not out of disrespect. I actually love coming here, the vibe, I love hanging with you guys. I love this. It's just that everything I think about is the consumer. It's the only thing that matters. And, and that's why I believe that, you know, and I, I'm, I'm humbled by some, you know, the most interesting or one of the, uh, one of the mo- we're doing some of the most interesting things because we just see it different. We just see it different, and the way we see it is practical. So, I mean, the far majority of what you've already worked on 
you would have never consumed. <laughs> that's the f- truth. And I think that's, that's my aspiration to come to things like this. Actually have a conversation about what the hell's going on, right? Like, creativity is amazingly fun. I think that we have to be very thoughtful that somebody's paying us to make something happen. You know, I think there's a, a lot of audacity that seeps into this craft where it becomes about ideology and, and selfish behavior. I watch creatives and strategists make decisions all the time based on what they want to blow up a building. They want to meet John Legend. They want this joke to see the world. It has nothing to do with what the client needs and definitely nothing to do with does the end customer care. Roadblocks are self-imposed based on judgment from other people. Think about, you know what, this is a perfect analogy. Think about how many times you guys get banged up on plays during games that so many people would take themselves out and not play at all. Oh, it hit it. That, you know, when you get banged, like, football's crazy. You guys are getting banged up on every play. And think about the tolerance. You guys know, you guys all know everything. You know the kid in this room who gets chipped up a little bit and is out. And you know the person that's on this team right now, they'll break their back and play. But for normal people like me, I'm like, every play would get me out. That's how I was as an entrepreneur. The shit that I think people think are Roblox. Do you know what it feels like to be 26 years old, have people that you went to high school with come to your liquor store, look you dead in the face as they pulled up in their BMW and say, oh, you work for your dad? And then you ring them up on their case of champagne that they're gonna use for their party and you bring it out to their car and put it in their trunk and they look you in the face with pity, I lived that life. And the way I took that scene was, I'll see you in 10 years. I was a DNF student. I, uh, I sucked at school. Like I, got, like I actually was so bad at school that I had my, my admin, my, my assistant, reach out to my high school and get a copy of my report card so I could put it on Instagram the other day because people are confused what success looks like or how you get there. It doesn't mean that you should look at me and not do school. It means that you need to look at yourself and figure out who you are. What are you good at? What do you like? How are you gonna get to the place that you wanna get to? And so for me, I got four A's in high school in my entire career, all in gym, right? <laughs> like, I got a D in yearbook. Uh, you know, and so to me, there's just a thousand paths out there. And so for me, I'm curious about one by one, one by one, for the 30 people in this room, where's their mindset? Where are they at? Who are they listening to? What are they judging their self-worth and their ambition based on? How are they counting the points? Because when you're a youngster, you're looking at all sorts of different things. You're being affected by all sorts of different voices. And for me, the only thing that worked, even though I was getting D's and F's and all my friends' parents told me I was a loser, even though all my teachers told me I wasn't gonna be anything, even though I didn't have stuff, even though I was, I just was in my own head. I knew exactly who I was. But the thing that I was willing to do was I was willing to work. And the thing that my parents taught me was not to dwell, not to cry about it. I didn't have when I When I rolled up on my mom when I was nine, when Nintendo, was popping, because when it first broke, I was like, Mom, I need Nintendo. She's like, good, go get it. And so I shoveled snow and I ripped people's flowers out of their yard and sold it back to them, (laughs) which is my favorite one. I think, again, what I'm really trying to establish in this talk this afternoon, this morning, is I don't think people have quantified the opportunity. I struggle, regardless of circumstance, when with people dwelling or complaining in a world where the internet is free, has no idea who you are, could care less, it's right there and it becomes a game of skill, not necessarily finances, to actually win. It's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that you can be in the retail business overnight by setting up a Shopify account, which costs nothing, when that same action to sell something 30 years ago meant that you had to sign a lease and build out a store and rely on the local traffic that walked by. It scares me and excites me that the biggest music company in the world, Spotify, was built in Sweden uh, by a kid. And on and on and on and you've heard every story. But more importantly, for every ridiculous story we've seen of 
Instagram or Facebook or Uber or Spotify, there are hundreds of thousands of stories of people with wins that are micro versions. I actually think the most unhealthy thing in entrepreneurship and opportunity is the big stories that everybody thinks they have to build a billion dollar company. I think we do not talk enough about the practical $150,000 a year, $300,000 a year, $700,000 a year business that you genuinely love what you do and you can live your life being happy and financially sound and what the cost of entry to be able to do that is in today's environment, which once again, let me say very slow, between putting out a media company, if you decide to put that on a WordPress or a Squarespace, a retail company, on, a, on the back of a Shopify, you could start a radio show that is global on the back of just uploading something you record on your memos on your phone and upload onto Spotify and Apple and SoundCloud. My friends, distribution is free. I know it's a nerdy thing. Like it's not like some big profound statement, but let me say it nice and slow. Distribution is free, it used to cost a fortune. Now what you put inside of it is the variable of your success, not your financial capabilities to create the distribution. You have, to, like, I, I wish we could zoom in. I literally have goosebumps on my neck right now. No, but really, I really do. It's like a very, I, 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 I will live my last breath trying to get people to understand this is remarkable. This is, this is a game of perspective. Are you educated or capable of seeing it from the lens that I'm speaking about today? Which is the barrier to reach the end person whether you're a financial advisor and trying to get to a client, whether you sell bow ties, whether you wanna be, how about the fact if you wanna be a professional football player and now there's all these websites where you can upload your film because the scout didn't come to your tiny, tiny town and now you actually can be discovered. Like, everything has changed. My question and my dream every time I speak is, can I get one person in this room to get their piece? I think one of the most important words for me to communicate in this talk today by far is patience. I promise you, no matter what you're doing in this room, and especially as I look around this room, first of all, everyone's uncomfortably attractive, and number two, and number two, but more importantly, this is quite a young audience, and I think the reality is the thing that I spend most of my time on is trying to get people to understand that patience is a very important variable of success and more importantly, that I believe the far majority of people in this room do not have a great relationship with time. I am fascinated by people in this room who are stressed at the ages of 18 and 22 and 25 and 29 like they're running out of time. How many people by show of hands are under 30 years old? <laughs> so for me, as you can imagine, when I see all those hands go up, you can put your hand down. Yeah, you're good, okay, good. <laughs> when I see all those hands go up, and I know in my mind with the way that modern medicine and technology is going, that the far majority of this room is gonna live for another 80 years, it really gets me excited slash concerned when people want their business to be huge next year. The quicker you want it, the more vulnerable you are. The quicker you want it, the more vulnerable you are. And what has been very fascinating for me is even though on YouTube and Instagram and maybe some of the places you guys see me, maybe my energy is high, Maybe my style of communication is fast, but my business actions are extremely slow. I highly recommend you get your head into a place where you just go on the offense, straight offense, because you have the options. You have the options. And so, I think it's the greatest time to be alive. The internet is still new. There's still so much to take. You could absolutely grab it. It could be yours. It's just about going, into a different place in your mind and get real quiet. Thing that got me through is everything got quiet. Everything became Charlie Brown. 
All those teachers, all those parents, all those people telling me I couldn't or I wasn't or I was losing, I just drowned them out. And so that would be my recommendation. Drown out the noise and get real focused on the opportunity. The way I deal with chaos and the way that I would deal in chaos if I was a upper middle leader in this team right now is realizing what's the alternative. You're in control. The reason chaos is easy for me is I know I'm in control. When a tornado or a hurricane or a virus or sales drop breaks out, I'm in control. Coronavirus, China sales are down, we're in control. We get to sit in a room and say, what are we gonna do? I love chaos. Like, if Mike Tyson's running at me and I'm a boxer, that chaos, this is why Holyfield beat him. You're in control. Yeah, it's not fun or scary or whatever, but you can duck. I'm most calm when there's the most chaos because I go into a place in my mind of like, what's the worst that can happen? What, am I die? Oh no? Then business? Who gives a crap? Put it in perspective. Put it in perspective. Stop being scared. You wanna win? in 2021, be nicer. You wanna win in 2021, have more compassion. You wanna lead in 2021, lead with this, not with what your head thinks your wallet is gonna benefit from. And I know that I'm sounding fluffy and da 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 da, but let there be no confusion. I'm an assassin when it comes to business. You may be hearing fluffy things, but let me get real close to the camera here, my friends. I'm trying to win the whole thing. I'm trying to be the greatest entrepreneur of all time. I believe that kindness, compassion, empathy, sympathy, first for your employees, then for your customers, and then you can think about yourself, is not Mother Teresa stuff. It's not Gandhi, Nelson Mandela stuff. I believe that it is sheerly and obviously the foundation of successful business in today's transparent universe. Your meanness that you think is motivating it can't be hidden the way it used to be. And so I want people to lead with optimism, kindness, and all these kind of soft skills because I think they're the emerging superpowers of business. And I think a lot of you should really be paying attention to it. We do not have the proper context around entrepreneurship. We, until we start understanding the level of talent involved in it, we will always undermine how difficult it is because we think it's a process. And that doesn't mean, I, again, this is why underlining that, we have to contextualize how awesome it is. We have to start putting on a pedestal, starting a direct-to-consumer you know, jam business on Shopify where you make 183,000 a year because you love making jam because you and your grandma made it and like that being a massive success because you're happy as and you can live your lifestyle and you live under the means of 183,000 a year. We have to put that on a pedestal. That is when entrepreneurship can hit its golden era. You've got two choices every day of your life. You're either optimistic or you're pessimistic. You're either seeing what's good or you're seeing what's bad. My whole life, even when I was like in a very different place, I would always just say seven billion people. Now it's seven, seven, seven point seven billion people. Where do I rank? For all the shit that I got, for all the negativity, where do I rank? Am I better than the person that's terminally ill, that has a lot of money, that's gonna die in a month? Yep. Am I better than somebody who's living in a cage in parts of the world that we don't even wanna look at? Yep. And so, to me, this is a mindset game. If you try to figure out how to bring value to somebody and you persevere, like, I really do think there's a play here. And honestly, to be very frank, I think Josh built a really meaningful business. I'm not in a mindset of investing now. I'd rather buy sports cards than invest in companies. But um, even though it wasn't like a perfect execution for me of like, I'm getting this value, then let me have him on the podcast. It, it, was, it was so important for me to have an actual human manifestation of the thing that I want all of you to do out there, which is like, look, if you wanna be a rapper, produ- a producer for rap, like go st- Ask 47,000 times, Metro Boomin, you know, Sunny Digital, like Murder Beat, like just ask, like ask. Now, if you know how to ask with grace, it's gonna work better. If you know how to reverse engineer the person of what they care about at this moment, like if somebody has a new album coming out and they're your favorite rapper, uh, Young Nudie has an album out today. If If Nudie's your guy, like you could have made 25 pieces of content on your, if you're that person, 
and sent it DM to him to help him post on his social channels because everybody needs more content and then that might have been the reason you got the job. When are you gonna start talking? What are you waiting for? If you are not communicating, you don't exist. I believe that. If you are not communicating, you do not exist. More importantly, communicate about what you love. What, what, what scares me about the long tail of the internet is I know there's somebody sitting in here who's watched every episode of Friends, okay? Deeply loves Friends. Can't get enough in their own mind of debating Rachel and Ross. Loved the show. Watch it every night to go to sleep to and I know they make 49, 62, 88, $103,000 a year doing something they don't like and I know that if they started a podcast about friends every day when they went home, instead of consuming content to escape the fact that they don't like their job, if they created content around the thing they love, that after 24, 36, 48 months, that along could have came Netflix and been a sponsor of that podcast that would allow them to actually leave that job they hate and now be a full-time friends podcaster. You don't believe that, I understand that. That seems like a far-fetched story to you. The problem is you don't live my life because I wrote a book in 2009 called Crush It that laid this out and I get to live the best life now where I get three to six emails a day of people that tell me this exact story. Whether it's about pickles. People like pickles. I do too, I eat pickles like crazy. Star Trek. Esports don't even get me started because I used to push it a lot and people have gone completely and made real careers in that. Just stuff. I just, I just really, really, really hope you hear me today. I'm completely driven by gratitude. Mm -hmm. Do you know how grateful I am? Like, do you know, what did I do? My parents had sex at this one moment and created me. (laughs) Like, like, I'm being serious, I'm just grateful. Like, I have such a good thing going. People like it, I like it, it's so good. But like, what did I do? Like, do you know how lucky I was that I was an immigrant? Do you know how much I'm driven by a chip on my shoulder? Do you know how lucky I got that I was four foot 11 when I went into freshman year of high school? Like, all these things went in my favor. I don't know, man, I'm driven by gratitude. Every morning I wake up and I'm just grateful. Grateful, grateful, grateful. I'm 42 years old almost, and unfortunate, thank you, and unfortunately, my grandparents, three of my four grandparents died before I got to know them. So, so not only was I born in a communist country where capitalism and entrepreneurship is done, I went to the place where it's most on a pedestal. I got the greatest mom in the world. My dad taught me work ethic and my word, which made me not a bullshit artist, saved my ass, right? But then on top of everything else, I've had very little death or pain around me and I'm 42 years old. It's unfortunate why that's the case, given the circumstances before, but it's still my reality, right? And then I have a communication style that for some reason, who knew? Don't forget I was 33 years old before I even made a video. Like I didn't even, I I never thought this could be, like I didn't even cross my mind. I was a businessman. Like watching 20 year olds that are hungry and thinking about their lives, right? I'm excited because I'm like, bro, you don't have any clue where this might go because you know, in, at 31 years old, I'm like, maybe I'll make a video on this YouTube thing. Like, you have no idea where it's going, so I'm completely driven by gratitude. I'm so thankful, I'm so grateful. There's a really dirty secret in the strategy world of like Bain and McKinsey where if you really get them drunk, they admit that the actions lead to the strategy, not the other way around. That's my answer to you. How? I make decisions and then I tried to look at my calendar the week ahead and see if any decisions I made four weeks earlier that made me think this was a good use of time. Am I able to move something, cut something down? I'm extremely thoughtful about cutting times of meetings. So one of the things I think that really make me successful is understanding a seven minute meeting is real Mm -hmm. and not just making it a 30 minute meeting. Um, But the real reason is because I don't overthink it. I'm operating my business, I'm in it. How do I decide between going to dinner with Kevin Hart because I can and I want to build top of the funnel brand or do I go take a mid-level client that I'm trying to build a relationship with? It's, you know, you ask every normal person, it seems like those aren't super close but I can touch the pulse and be like, I'm going to LA four more times in the next three months. 
you know, the biggest mistakes I make are the ones of missed opportunities of the things by being crippled by opportunity. When you actually level that all up, my friend, it really is liberating. You will never even come close to making the right decision. I mean it. You just don't know what the alternative would be. People think that there's a right answer. You as an operator of your business make the right call that feels right at that moment and just move. And people spend all this time and money on trying to think that there's a proper answer. I play on the extremes. I, I spend as much time as possible on the things that are showing me the most offense, right? However you're doing your customer acquisition to get to a hundo on a product like that, like whether it's Facebook, whether it's brand, whether it's, and then I spend the amount of time on my biggest vulnerability. You know, putting my finger in the holes to make sure the boat doesn't sink and building a bigger boat and nothing in the middle. And knowing that I'm making that judgment at all times and the second I get new data a week later, I might have to completely change what I thought was right the week before. It's also why I spend a ton of time with my employees. The reason I'm an HR driven CEO is if you really understand this, both your biggest growth and your biggest vulnerabilities are actually your own team. So I think it's a lack of, it starts with the ability not to overjudge yourself because that is the liberator of the model I just broke down for you. If you don't provide real actual value to people in exchange for the money that you're asking for in return, you will lose over time. It happens every time. You might be able to make some quick cash, but you will never win long term and you will go through the same sh- over and over. There are plenty of 30, 40, 50 year olds in here who go up and down, up and down, up and down because their stuff is horse sh- and it's not coming from the right place and they're looking to make a quick buck and some character on stage says that they got a process that's gonna make it happen fast and they're wrong. You guys know Grey Goose? The guy who invented that as an entrepreneur invented it at 78. Sidney Frank, 78 years old. You know? Life is like sports. Like, one of the great moments of my life with AJ is the Monday Night Miracle at the Meadowlands with the Jets Dolphins. That shit was 30 to seven in the fourth quarter. And they won, they came all the way back. My cousin left, went home to Queens, went to sleep. I called him when they tied it at 30 and said, can you believe this shit? He's already sleeping. He left that game and was already sleeping in Queens. I was like, what are you talking about? Hung up, and then the Dolphins scored. and made it 37-30, and we blamed Bobby for waking up. (laughs) But like, that's life. Like, you could do everything wrong, have every dream you've ever had get up, blame it on other people, the girl it up, that injury it up, coach it up, blame everybody, have everything go wrong, be 57 years old, and still have 40 years to make it right. It's crazy, honestly, like if there was some crazy new drug that I could like inject in you that gave you perspective of time, you guys too, that's the drug I would give you, straight up. It makes you optimistic. People are sitting here dwelling already. Dwelling already. I shouldn't have come to Rutgers, I knew it. Of course there's people thinking that. Like that's just real life. Dwelling already haven't even started. Man, that's what I want to change. The only thing that you can do wrong is not being yourself. I see a lot of people scared to actually be themselves because they're scared who's watching. And like, I hate looking at all your LinkedIn accounts. You've got like a suit and tie, looking all professional. Like you think something bad's gonna happen if you're, you're normal, I look like a mess. Up here, I'm wearing a Tierra Whack sweatshirt. Like, the results always win. And I think a lot of people hold back their natural self. The market doesn't care in the end. Somebody may judge you, but the market doesn't care. I spend all my time listening. The reason I want people to leave comments is I read them. I read all the comments. I read the ones that say that I'm the best, I read the ones that say that I'm the worst, I read the one, and all I do is I listen. It's so funny, I get made fun of when I ask Gary Vee because I'm always interrupting people. It's because I've gotten so good at listening, I know what the f- people are gonna say before they say it. I just wanna move on, you know? So, one of the ways to get the next clients is to never let the last client fail. The only way not to let a client fail is to over listen 
and provide them what they want at all costs, which is why I always push against people selling to the bottom because the bottom doesn't know what to do with it and then you're never gonna win, you're just gonna keep regurgitating the bottom. And so that's how I did it. I did it first and then I listened very carefully to the first 20 clients to make sure there was no chance that there was gonna be any vulnerability and I built on the word of mouth of our quality deliverables for the client. Everybody's got so much pressure to like have it figured out when they come out of school. Like it's time to be real and real life and all that shit. It's stupid. 22 to 30 should be experimenting. And travel, if you, like, and people are like, well I don't have money. I'm like, you can still travel. You can get a bullshit plane ticket. You can take a bus, like do shit. So I think you're not gonna find what you love. Like it's like food. I'm always fascinated by oysters. The amount of people that think they hate oysters even though they've never had one. I see so many people living life that way. You don't know your passion because you haven't done shit, Billy. I learn from so much doing. That's why my data is so clean. It's why I'm an innovator. It's why I'm fast. It's why a lot of good things happen for me because I realize just the doing is actually more efficient than the thinking about it. Somebody said something really smart, funny to me once and it was like the dig of this version and it's a really funny conversation. He was talking about VaynerMedia at the time. This was maybe five or six years ago. He said, you know, Gary, I gotta tell you, I love your company, but I gotta take a little bit of a knock on you. He was trying to set it up. I'm like, okay, what is it? He goes, where, I'm, where I think you need to be more thoughtful, Gary, is I have a feeling, though, that you might run through that glass panel and sit with us when you could have just opened the door. And I said, yeah, but which one was cooler? The internet's here. It's a complete land grab. There's unlimited opportunity. Nobody cares where you started. Nobody's stopping you. There's nobody that's gotta take your resume. There's no grades that matter, none of it. What matters is, are you willing to hustle? And how bad do you want it? And are you willing to live a life where you're not letting other people judge you? So then you're not pandering to it. I think one of the reasons I'm successful and one of the things I try to push a lot of people to think about is, can you love your process? You know, if you're in this, and entrepreneurship is cool now. Yeah. If you're in this. Too cool. Too cool. That's exactly right. If you're in this to flex on Instagram, you're gonna lose. Yeah. And, uh, and I was doing it when it was in the 80s and 90s in America. Uh, entrepreneurship wasn't a thing. That was actually when this country people thought it was something bad. Co- and, and America like, too. You're, if you're, you're a bad dude. If you're an entrepreneur, Risk. you're actually a loser yeah. living off of mommy and daddy. Yeah, it yeah. was, It was. you're exactly right. And you and I know this, a lot of the kids don't know. Yeah. Now, it's like being a rapper or an athlete. Yeah. It's incredible for me to watch what's transformed over 30 years. Uh, but I was willing to do it because it's all I could do. I, I, I listen to athletes, actors and actresses, singers, uh, artists, and in their documentaries, inevitably, they're like, well, I just couldn't do anything else. And as an entrepreneur, that's how I think. One of the biggest reasons, forget about the current way people view Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg's deep understanding of human psyche was the number one reason we connected. I think I'm an extremely good marketer because I think this entire thing that we're at right now is an internal B2B ecosystem and the only thing I pay attention to is the end consumer. I know so little about what's going on here. This is, this is literally the first three years I was here, I only did this event. I didn't know anything else. You guys remember, I don't, I st- Harriet just joined us to run comms from BBDO, she's incredible. I'm still asking her on the way here. She's like, we were fi- final list, what's it called? Shortlist. She's like, we were shortlisted for a bunch of stuff today. I'm like, I don't even know. The, I, I literally thought it was finalist. Like, I still, don't, Adam, yesterday we won a silver thing, and I was like, what does that mean? Like, I still am so deeply unaware of what's happening here. Not out of audacity, not out of disrespect. I actually love coming here, the vibe. I love hanging with you guys. I love this. It's just that everything I think about is the consumer. It's the only thing that matters. Fame and money doesn't change you, fame and money takes the energy out of you. It takes the hunger out of you. When you're not hung, when you're hungry and nobody's feeding you, but then you get a big 18 burgers and you eat them all. So I'm trying to, I'm always suppressing the good that everybody's chasing because it keeps me hungry as Let me give you the most liberating thing that I could ever tell an artist or somebody trying to make something happen. If you're good enough, it's gonna happen. I believe it. 
I believe in that the most. All the people that are now 53 and they thought they were good enough, they weren't. It wasn't that they picked the wrong manager. It wasn't that the gatekeeper stopped them. They weren't good enough. Especially now, my guy. What gatekeeper? Keep putting shit on SoundCloud and Spotify. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 20 years ago, Killy had no shot. There were gatekeepers. There's no gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud, that's the gatekeeper. And guess what? Even if you run rap caviar, you're not the gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. You're a mini, mini, mini gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. How does shit show up on rap caviar? Not that, shit's happened. Then they pick. But you gotta get to that first step. Love your fans unconditionally. Put out music that's in your soul. Shit will happen. I love that shit. I love the selfish, selfish, selfish and selfless shit. I love pulling from opposite directions. I love giving a fuck what some nerd in his basement is saying about me anonymously on your tweet. And I equally love that I don't give a fuck about what anybody thinks, including my parents and my mom. That's the best. Of course, we all do. I'm reading all of it. I'm the greatest. I'm a piece of shit charlatan and everything in between. And I'm just taking it in. And the best part is I'm unbeatable. The people that say I'm the greatest, I'm like, fuck you, I suck shit. The people that are like, you suck shit, I'm like, I'm the best of all time. I'm gonna stick it in your mouth. Like, that's what you have to do. It's the balance. We started VaynerMedia. You know, it's interesting. My aspirations were a couple things I didn't know. First of all, the first 45 people that worked for my agency had zero days of agency experience. I mean, you want to talk about a show? Like, we won a million dollar scope from Pepsi, and on the way out, the guy grabs me and says, hey, incredibly provocative. You're going to get the business. This is incredible. This is what we're looking for. It's 2009. Then he goes, he goes, one piece of advice, I'm like, please, because it was so early. He goes, you need to hire somebody who knows how to make a deck. <laughs> I will never forget that. And by the way, it took us another three years before we actually knew how to make a deck. We, we, are the fa- we are the fastest organically grown to $100 million revenue agency in the industry's history. And we win no RFPs. Like, we're just incapable. Because we come in with a philosophy, we're not willing to like, you know, everybody sells on an idea and it's just not something, you know, we, we, we half pregnant it, we, we flirt with it, but like the truth is we have, a, we have a philosophy, which is a couple things that we believe in that I think are unique. One, we believe that volume of creative is the cost of entry of relevance of the next decade and that we think this world needs to understand that quantity does not mean lack of quality. What do you have to do to be successful? I think people like us um, don't understand how, I think in history people look back at what I figured out as a really important moment which is it is remarkable that I don't spend any time being Gary Vee. I figured out my model which was following me. You're not gonna be able to do that. If you take 15 to 20 minutes and whether we help with that infrastructure, you get an intern, million different things but if, let me tell you how easy it could be. If you text, I'm gonna just use them, Sal, and be like, this week I wanna talk about cryptocurrency. If Sal shows up downstairs at the bar of your building or at the Starbucks, Mm -hmm. and that 15 minutes is Sal asking you four questions, and you answer them, and then that is a LinkedIn post the next day in first person, Sal writing it. That is, that is what I've done. I run a 900 person company. I'm not, I don't have time to do, like what I'm doing is, I'm filming this right now. This meta moment might be how a busy executive, said I want it, how a busy executive needs just 15 minutes to be in the content game. This right here is how I figured it out, right? Originally it was the Ask Gary Vee show where I did have to sit down for an hour and interview Hannah and her six year you know, at VaynerMedia, right? Now, I've gone much further down to Daily V where I'm just being filmed because I don't even have that hour to do that YouTube show. Then I did that for three years and all of a sudden I'm like, mm, that content's getting stale and weirdly, in the last month, I'm back to doing a little bit of Ask Gary Vee. I'm fighting for that hour. So, but the key is, how do you not disrupt yourself but you need to have something that's a pillar. Do the shit that got you here. Uh-huh. This is when all the new characters come into your life uh-huh. and start telling you how to do it different. 
I'm getting more ridiculous in my truth right. than ever, the bigger it's getting. Mm-hmm. Like, if all these people know, I love when people got voices like that are not living it. Mm-hmm. And they're gonna give you the commodity advice. You know, like, you've gotta start doing yoga. You gotta start eating granola. Like, do, do the shit that got you here. Well, the stuff that got me here, roughly speaking, would be like fast food, uh, hard drugs, uh, <laughs> promiscuous sex at an alarming rate. Wrong. Okay, not those things. No, no, those things are great. <laughs> great. No, wrong. The things that got you here is you were willing to do that in the face of people telling you not to do that. Mm. And so maybe you don't need to eat a fat burger anymore and do whatever the fuck you want, but you need to triple down on your intuition and do. That's how you got here. Mm. Did everybody think it was a great idea to be a BMX website dude? No. Good. That seemed like a very strange idea right. to many people at the time. Right. Now. So, like, listen, my man, honestly, this is the time you have to quadruple down on what got you here. The thesis, not the direct action. But you don't see people run themselves into the ground. You've never been concerned about that, at people, least for yourself. Pe- people run themselves into the ground when they start wavering from what they are and they start doing behaviors that don't come natural to them mm-hmm. and then they break. And the ones that do, don't. Henry Rollins figured that out. Mm. He would have run himself in the ground if he wanted to be Mick Jagger. Right. And Mick Jagger would have run himself in the ground if he wanted to be somebody else, a politician. When you do the shit that you don't want to do because you think it's the right thing to do because you graduated to the next spot, you lose. At the end of the day, vanity metrics, whether that's followers on Instagram, whether that's the jewelry or car you drive, no matter what it is, at the end of the day, underneath all of that, There needs to be something tangible and real and if you're not asking for business and more importantly, if you're not selling something you believe in, you're finished. The single reason I think I'm a great salesman as somebody who hates to ask for a sale is because I deeply believe in what I'm selling. Whether it's the wine I produce, whether it's a sneaker collaboration I have with K-Swiss, whether it's Vayner, I I sit in this, do you know what it feels like to sit in this room and know, think, know that VaynerMedia is the best marketing firm in the world, it's, it's empowering. You, you sell with conviction. And I, I just watch way too many people uh, either be deeply insecure about what they're selling because deep down they know they have no idea what the f- they're selling. Well, I said they don't know what they're selling. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Or they're just broken. They just so care about money. They know exactly what they're selling. They just know they're selling bullshit and they're f- preying on people's fears and I want to kill those I started the agency with 45 people that didn't work in the industry. I knew nothing about the industry. I read nothing about the industry, so I started VaynerMedia. I built a creative shop that I put media in the name. I had both media and creative under one roof and had no idea that it was unique. So we're, we were doing all these unusual things. What it led to is a very large agency that has not played by the industry rules, but has driven business results for its clients. So now we do have 900 people globally. We do have the US, LA and New York offices and London and opening up Singapore and very frankly, feel very confident we're about to get a big scope for the World Cup in Qatar and that means Middle East and looking at you know, South America. So I, I think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. I think because of some of the awards we're winning this week, just I'm feeling from the creative class here a little bit of more of a, okay, you can be in the club and I'm laughing. I'm like, I don't want to be in the club. I don't mind to be in the club, but there's only one club I want to be in, which is, wouldn't you want to be a creative that in real life when you hang out with your friends, people know what you're talking about? Like how many more times do people here want to spend 20 years of their life making TVC that when they talk about it, and they're like, you know, the IBM spot and their friends and relatives are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And if they do, it's because they tried really hard to find it. Right? Um, I think that people want to, I think if you're creative, I think you want it to be seen. I, I just don't know what else to say. And I think, you know, what Mike and Adam will tell you if you decide to yap with them after this is after having careers in fancy places doing fancy stuff, it's fun to make. It, you know, Think about all the ideas that you guys have had that will never see the day of life. Like, you guys are all 12 years away, (laughs) six years away, four years away from being the final decision maker to actually see something made. Right now, you're politicking 
and, and strategizing on how to convince the two people above you to actually make the thing you believe in. You're not in the creative industry, you're in the internal politicking industry. <laughs> That's why volume will set this industry free. We have interns from day one in ad school being able to see their thoughts in market from the biggest brands in the world. Literally, interns are re- we have literally interns already in our company that have had more pieces of content seen by humans than some of the people here. That's real. That's going to play out, I hope, for all of you. I want you to be in a place where you get to be creative for real <laughs> instead of working at a bank and uh, fighting for a half pregnant version of your idea to see the world. And that's why so many of you have to do things on the side because you can't scratch your itch. I think about like why was I an F student? Because I promise you, if there was a business school for K through 12, right? Here's my thing, right? If you would have taught me why New Coke failed in 1984 in fifth grade, I would have got an A. Instead, you wanted to teach me how many rings were around Saturn. I'm getting about that, right? The problem is most businesses are not playing the marathon. They're playing the sprint, right? They're not worried about lifetime value and retention. They're worried about short-term goals. Social is not going to excite anybody in this room for what it's going to do to your bottom line in a six month or 12 month period. It just can't happen. See, social media marketing is like going Beyonce on your customers. You've gotta put a ring on it. (laughs) Meanwhile, 99% of the people in here, and I looked at some Twitter and Facebook accounts of some of the peeps in this room. 90% of you, more, but I'm trying to be nice, are treating social media like a one night stand. Most companies are failing in social because everybody in social is acting like a 19 year old dude. They're trying to close on the first transaction. It's going right? You may love talking about basketball, you might just be boring. So you've gotta be self aware about it. But my big thing is, you may be boring, but it makes you so happy. Like, my big thing is, people don't like their jobs or lives, and then they go and consume things to escape, and I'm trying to get them to create to get happy. You may never become Stephen A. Smith, but if you start a podcast about the Pelicans, even if it gets a little juice, maybe some free tickets to a game, now you're pumped, you like the Pelicans. It's a lot better than watching an entire Aaron Hernandez Netflix documentary. I also think that all of these things that we're talking about can be scaled, right? So my career is going along nicely and then, and I'm winning on email marketing, 90% open rates, and I'm winning on Google AdWords, the day it comes out, I'm buying every wine term, that's working for my dad. And then comes along YouTube. And I see this platform and I say to myself, there's something here. And you can't run ads on it on the time, at the time. So I decided to do a show. And I never thought of myself as gift of, you know, I thought of myself as gift of gab, but more like a good salesman or, you know, a class clown that the teacher kind of liked, you know? And so I didn't realize what I was gonna be able to do in that format, but I started a very big show that garnered a lot of attention and it really, really worked and it really got going. And it really taught me, oh my God, I don't have to spend marketing money. This attention is trickling down organically to my dad's business. There's something here. And then Twitter came out and I start using it to promote Wine Library TV. And I'm like, oh my God, this Friendster MySpace thing is about to become much bigger. This social, it wasn't called social media yet. It was called Web 2.0. Twitter was known as a Web 2.0 app. And I started using it and Google buys YouTube for $1.7 billion. And I say to myself, oh my God, I was right about this, I was right about Google AdWords, I was right about email. I'm, bet- I'm not a wine retailer, I understand what people are gonna do. I need to become an investor in what I think people are gonna do. In 2007 I invested in Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, and that obviously changed my life. My brother was graduating from college. I was starting to make videos about business that were catching people's attention. and. 
in 2009, I decided to start VaynerMedia to do marketing for the biggest brands in the world so I could learn big business because I understood Silicon Valley, I understood small business entrepreneurship, but I didn't understand executive Fortune 500 land and I didn't understand why they were doing so many silly things in a world where I thought Netflix, Facebook, Amazon were gonna be the next big thing and they turned out to be way bigger than I even kind of predicted, even though I was predicting the tippy top. And so. That's been my career. I've written five New York Times best-selling books around marketing and um, and consumer behavior and psychology. But what does all this hyperbole around me mean? It means that I believe that every person who's watching this right now is me in 2009. Here's what I mean by that. I had a level of success. I was good. I was enjoying myself. I was building a big company for my parents. I was excited to think about what I was gonna do for myself next. But the scale of the internet by using the tools completely changed my life. And I believe that what the internet does is exposes things. So I don't think the internet changed me. I don't think it made me nicer and stronger at my craft. I think it made more people aware that I was nice and strong at my craft. And so I think for everybody who's watching right now, I don't think they realize that if they started producing content on LinkedIn about what they know, not what you think people want, not to get followers, but to put out content of what you know. Storytell, my grandpappy taught me when I was 10, this, I now did this for my salesperson today. That's the video. You don't have to be an expert. I'm not an expert. I'm a person that has hypotheses and opinions and because a lot of them became true after 15 years and I've put the actual business wins on the board, now people look at me in a different way but I don't even, you know, even the flattering introduction and our talk beforehand, you know, she makes me feel so good but I don't think that makes me special. I think it's just a nice feeling to be admired. You know, uh, and, and I think when you layer humility and curiosity around being good at a tool, great things happen. Let me give you an example. When books came out, yeah, I'm being serious now. When books came out, clearly, and I have no knowledge of this, but this is very easy to understand, clearly there were individuals who became more aggressive at reading them and amassed knowledge. And my intuition is the ones that were able to be practical and operating were able to do something with that knowledge and succeed. When tractors and innovation hit farming, the people that didn't demonize it, and many did, many said that's not real farming because they were fearful that it was gonna take away jobs from their people, which was a nice thing, but they were trying to fight technology, which is always the wrong answer. Let there be no confusion. If you hear or feel anything from this keynote and Q&A today, please let it be this. If you are fighting against technology, you will lose. It is the history of mankind. We are absolutely at an inflection point where there's people like me and different things happening where we're starting to have different conversations. Like nothing, freedom is what everybody's chasing, but they're confused about what it actually looks like. It's not how much you make, it's how much you spend. There's a lot of people who could be way more free if they didn't overextend themselves on what they're buying. What's Keeping up with the Joneses, uh, it is the poison of our society. To scale, I do believe you need culture. You know, at a thousand people, we have offices in Singapore and London and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Like, you've you've gotta really have culture. I think the fact that you're even thinking about it already means you have a shot at it. It means you're gonna throw money at it and you're gonna have an HR department that cares about the employees, not as a disguise for the finance team to fire people. It's just intent. Like just even hearing how much you know, talking, seeing your vibes and the crew, this is just intent. The reason I always win is because I have intent. My employees first, my customers second, me third. That's a very easy way to win in business. I think we all know that's not how most people do it. And if you're sitting here right now and saying, me, I'm gonna start this business to buy a boat. (laughs) Two, customers, because they're the people that are gonna give me money. Three, employee, you're gonna build a very small business. If you're self-aware, you don't try to do things you can't do. You focus on things you do like. You don't try to be something you're not. If you have self-esteem, you're not scared to put it out, the content, the video, the picture, the audio. 
Because you're not worried if Sally Pants 49 thinks you're ugly. You're not worried that Rick Thompson from a competitive company says you're stupid. You're just not worried. You're not worried that you have bags under your eyes or you're overweight or you're losing your hair. You're just not worried. You're, you're focused on your self-esteem. You're focused on yourself. You're focused on your self-awareness, which puts you in a position to succeed. And so all of you, one of the worst, not worst, one of the challenging times in my career was around 2012 when people all wanted to be like me. And I'm a very, very over the top, high energy personality who's very, very comfortable on video. And that is just not gonna be the case for everybody. And I tell everybody, and it took me a while to get to this good answer, which I think has helped people. Listen, my friends, if you're watching this right now and be like, okay, I see what Gary's setting up. He's gonna ask me to start producing a lot more content. That's the answer, by the way. Well, I don't wanna do video. Well, I'm like, good news, Sarah. You don't have to do video. You might, uh, for example, I'm a terrible writer. If I was a great writer, I'd be writing a lot more. Because writing on LinkedIn crushes. As a matter of fact, my team loves when I, I write all the copy on my Instagram posts, right? All of them, everyone, every post in my life. And they get pumped when I get motivated and like write a real good one because we know the post does better. Copy is the most underrated thing in social media today. It drives so much of the success of the picture and the video. So, by the way, you might be an audio, you might be a talker, but you're insecure about your visual of how you look, or the camera makes you freeze, but you're great with talking, so good. There's now Clubhouse, an incredible app you can go and be a thought leader in. There's just recording audio and posting that on your LinkedIn. LinkedIn, for this group, knowing who's in the room, is equivalent to what Facebook was in 2012. That will lead to incredible financial and emotional success to those in here that heed the call that I'm yelling today. Period, end of story. I could not be more passionate about everybody here getting very serious. And then what you put out is up to you. You know, my recommendation is that it brings value to people, whether it's entertaining, whether it's informational. But I also believe that stories, stories are easier for people. This is something that I'm gonna start talking a lot about, a lot more about. I think stories, just stories, like life lessons. Grandma told me, and then if you're good at, and I've already talk, brought this up, I'm gonna bring it up again because I'm trying to help everybody here, give you some training wheels. If you say, hi, I'm Karen, I'm a sales lead at this company. I, this is for my team, but honestly, this is for the broader world because all you sales leaders, I know how it is. You know, when I was nine, my grandmother took me to a Girl Scouts event and Sarah Johnson did this and my grandma, I did this and grandma told me to do that and then I did this and me and Sarah Johnson were best friends in high school and that's ironic because I had a big tiff between Carl and Carla recently on my team and I did this, like my grandma did that and now they just closed the biggest account together. That story, that should come very natural and by the way, you don't need to call out Carl and Carla, right, because that's active. You're in the world right now. You can be two people on my team. Just think about how easy that is for what everyone's struggling with, which is, well, what do I post? What do I post is grounded in lack of self-esteem and lack of strategy. Period. And so I'm here today to build your self-esteem and not in a delusional way. I'm just trying to encourage you to realize how real this is because the content creators that build awareness and audiences will have the leverage in business, whether it's a small, narrow world. And by the way, this is a small, narrow sector, most of the business people on this call in this thing. That's great, actually. The reality is, that's great. Because then you run a couple of dollars in ads on LinkedIn against targets of companies that are in your sector, and you're getting exactly who you want. I actually like when groups are narrow, because you can get so much more specific. So anyway, I'm just very excited to be here. I want to encourage everyone to realize the opportunity. If you can get to the place where you have social, you need to write, sing and dance on Instagram, use hashtags, right? You got the book, you can read it, you can go sell it for four bucks, I don't give a what you do, but you need to go out and you have to make content at scale because if you can sing, you need exposure. So if you can sing, well then, my question is, this is not just, you know, like I think people get confused by making it, if you want to write, sing, and dance, you also have to figure out how, how that's balanced with how you're gonna live. 
right? So there's a big difference between being Beyonce and being somebody who makes 50,000 a year singing. Both are interesting, that's your talent. So first of all, you gotta figure out how good you are because people are delirious out here. People think they're going to the league. People think they're, gonna, they're the next Meek. You know, people think that they're the next Beyonce. Like people are delirious out here. Meanwhile, some people are it. So to me, here's the funniest part. There's no more debating. Take your phone, point at your fit self and do it. And then figure out if people like it. And when people say they don't like it, you gotta make more of it. You need two, three, four years of rejection before you give up. Years. People post one post on Instagram of them freestyling, people shit on them and they give up. We've literally built society backwards. Like when you first get out of the school machine which maps zero to real life, you're supposed to go play real life to have a chance to figure out what you do. So I mean, where do you start? You start with what are you consuming and paying attention to when you have leisure time? Do you play video games? Do you listen to music? Do you like to go out and eat weird food? Do you, like, what do you like? That's where you start. So what do you like, Ahmed? Like, what are you about? Um, I, I kind of, like, I'm kind of a geek. Uh, I like, like comic books. Good, let's start with comic books. Do you want to create comic books? Do you want to sell comic books? Do you want to buy comic books and flip them? Do you want to work at Comic-Con? All of those things would be a good place for you to start. Cold email and DM 850 different people that are players in the comic book world and one of them might reply to you and that starts your career. Like you could literally work for Funko tomorrow. You could literally work for Marvel tomorrow. You could. You just have to write 137 compelling emails and DMs and LinkedIn things. What's up, brother? Yeah, bro, you can literally do that. How, who's, who's 43 and older? We couldn't do that, Ahmed. That's not how it worked when we were coming up the game. You didn't just like say, like, we, you know, that actually ironically, once in a while I come across an OG who's like, actually I did do that. I wrote 800 letters. It took two months for me to get a response instead of two hours. But yeah, man, I mean like, you know, in the comic world, there's the movie aspect, there's the actual skill of it. Like if you go, like if you like the drawing of it, you could, look, let me tell you one thing about winners. A lot of winners didn't get there by accident. So when you write a winner an email, your favorite illustrator at DC Comics, hey Sarah, I will bring you coffee, get your laundry, grind and bleed, just to intern or work at minimum wage just to see how you do it. I love that everybody's so into math and big data and quant and have not deployed the level of gratitude around the math of 400 trillion to one which is the odds of being a human being. There's nothing you'll ever accomplish that's more remarkable than that you have a chance to accomplish something. If, if we can lean into gratitude, there you go. a lot of good can happen. I don't know, I'm, I'm just super grateful and it is an enormous, st- there is no Red Bull, there is no soda or coffee that comes anywhere close to gratitude. People well, think I'm drugged the fuck up. <laughs> I haven't even smoked a cigarette in my life because my mom got Nancy Reagan, you know, and so, so, I just came to realize, oh, shit, this insanity is predicated on gratitude. When you're so grateful for the at-bat, you're happy. But people dwell about dumb shit. Yeah, the small stuff is so small. And, people uh, are like mad when they get the wrong milk. <laughs> like seriously, I go to Starbucks, you know, I travel a lot, you go to Starbucks and like, I asked for almond milk. I'm like, this bought a $7 coffee. Like, it's crazy. The f*** is the matter with people? Uh. We need to start some sort of cultural rule that anybody who's mean to somebody that works at Starbucks should get punched in the throat. (laughs) Like, it should become a meme. Like, it's the collective responsibility of somebody to punch that person in the face. My great grandmother and grandmother came from the old country and really almost every time they drank tea or when the men were drinking vodka, you'd always kind of do this thing where you spoke to good health. Everything was to good health, to good health, to good health. I think it brainwashed me in the greatest way of all time. I 
for me, 2020 is a year that has incredible underlining pain for a lot of people who feel that they were robbed of years with people they love. I am one of the lucky people that did not have that happen. And so thus, after that, you know, Vayner speakers and, and, and Vayner productions took massive hits, lost millions of dollars. Doesn't register because that's business. That's almost like not real life. Like money is not real life. Real life is very basic. Do the 12, 15, 20 people I love, did they live in 2020? And yes, amazing, best year ever. And, and you know, I also am a good operator, but I will say this, if I owned 15 restaurants, it would have been, and we were mandated to close. Now, from my perspective, because I always believe in innovation, I believe my DoorDash and Uber Eats and direct to consumer would have been stood up already, and I probably would have grown. And 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 I think it forced a lot of restaurants to finally do the right things. Uh, and so it's just a really interesting time. If you're a capable operator, and you have life in a simplistic mindset, you're going to be happy way more often. I worked for my dad's liquor store when I was from 22 to 34 years old. I built my dad's liquor store to a $60 million business and at 34 years old I left and had nothing. It was my dad's business. I would inherit it one day but I hope my dad lives forever and I'll be 90, right? So like I did what I thought was right. Different circumstance but I did what, what I thought was right. I was an immigrant kid. My parents took me from Russia to America. I wanted to pay them back. I worked my face off, gave up all my 20s. Right? Super easy to be humble with her when you're humble. (laughs) You know? So, you know, when I hear you asking that question without knowing every one of your details, I think you gotta do what you have to do to get to the next step to give yourself more options. Got it? So like if you're good at it and it works and it can get you to that next spot that gives you options at 30, how old are you? I'm uh, 15. Mazel. You're 15. If that can get you to a place at 27, that gives you options, you'll be a kid at 27. At 15, you think 27's dead, old. I get it. I remember. But I'm telling you to your face, it's young kid, you're a young kid. How many people here would love to be 27? I am. (laughs) Get to that next spot. I get it. Listen. Let me tell you one thing that you will not hear often. The person that knows how to eat the most amount of usually eats the most amount of caviar. Got it? You need to eat get to the next spot. Not directly, (laughs) but you understand? If it's good like that and that can get you to the next spot, that's perfect regardless of what it is. Whatever gets you to the next spot is exactly, move forward. It's good, man. I'm glad you, if you have something like that brewing, that excites me. That's real easy for me to see how it can go for you. You just gotta be patient. That's where you gotta stay disciplined and save that money and not buy all the stuff that's getting fed to you that you need. It's hard to get to the next spot when you spend 700 bucks to buy a Supreme bag. We're talking about authenticity yes. in a brand. What does it mean to you from a brand communication? You know, it's, this is an interesting question. I have a pretty, for this world, a pretty left field point of view on this. And my point of view is that we need to achieve relevance. I'm looking at 11, 12, 13 faces right now and what Pepsi or BMW or Coca-Cola or Facebook means to all these people is actually different. And so for me, authenticity gets very close to relevancy because when you're a big brand, there are so many variables in your world. There's so many things that you're doing. You know, some people may drink a cola to get a burst of energy. Others, it may be a reminder of spending time with their grandmother. And I think we're so literal in today's brand and marketing world. We're so stuck on sentences and adjectives and we spend so much time on subjective things that don't matter to the consumer on the other end. So my perspective is, much like a human being, you and I are gonna act differently right now as humans in this interview than if we were with our family, than if we were in a weekend in Las Vegas with our best friends, than if we were presenting to 5,000 people. People are always like, Gary, you're a little bit different than when you I see you on video. I'm like, yeah, I'm on stage to 7,000 people versus I'm here with you. There's different versions. And I think people struggle in ad land to understand things are multi-dimensional. And so for me, authenticity is actually being comfortable 
in the 74 to 7400 variations of how you show up. And so I think that we are, uh, that human beings, executives, are limiting brands' ability to be authentic because they want it to be so literal and so safe and so PR'd and so approved by the queen bee that, uh, that I think we live in a very non-authentic world. And I think the reason humans continue to scale in popularity is they're a focus group of the audience. They're, uh, they're, a, they're an executive group of one. And I, I think one of the reasons real celebrities are struggling and have lost share is they do have PR people. They do have big deals with movie studios that they're scared of breaking. And so I think anyone who could actually show all the versions of themselves will win. And I think right now, the creative industry, A, isn't set up to make enough creative, B, has way too much B2B DNA in it to actually show up authentic. And this is not schizophrenia, this is not throw up against the wall and see what sticks, this is not being scattered, this is being true. And so I think authenticity uh, has a far more, uh, at its end, there's always a, something that delivers at the end, a piece of content or creative and I think it's being far more wide than it's been over the last 80 years. So many people listening right now are 28 and are way ahead of where I was, are 32 and way ahead of where I was. Okay. So it speaks to what you can do in a decade if you got it. 25 year old me, super pent up to prove to the world, most likely myself though, that I'm as good as I am. I just got done with my first full year of running the company. We went from three to like 8.9 million in a blast. And now I'm in year two, now I'm really in it, 18 months fully, obviously through college and high school, I was in the store, but now I'm the guy. Yep. And I'm a machine, 7 a.m. in the store, leave at uh, 10 p.m. every night, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every night, Monday through Saturday. Mm. Uh, No going out, no girlfriend. Um, Sunday, sleep till like noon, go to my parents' house, talk business, in the fall, watch the Jets. In the not fall, hang out with my little brother and my sister. Um, 100% 1940s immigrant family man kind of world. Every day, 7 to 10 p.m. Every day, every day, every single day of my 25, every day. Sleep to new, 11 a.m. Sunday, garage sale and go to flea markets on, as a side hustle on Saturday for fun or Sunday for fun because I liked it or watch the Jets, or go to my parents' house an hour away from my apartment at that point, 45 minutes away, to hang out and talk business to set up the next week, every day. That is literally my entire life. So when people now are like, oh, I hustle, yet, like, like I get it, but it's by their standards. It is not by immigrant, you know, bal- and I like that people have balanced lives. I think that's great. That's just my answer to who 25-year-old me was. I'm in the business of providing value for the people that work for me, so I don't have a preference of how they want to use it, even if it's just a check-in to, you know, I had one recently with an employee that's been with us for seven years and she's been crushing it, and we hadn't talked in maybe two and a half years, and it was just, it was, I think she just needed to feel for five minutes that I did have my hands in everything, AKA, I don't have my hands in anything, but I'm aware of quite a bit, if not, most things, and her hearing that where I could speak to detail on things that she started talking about gave her confidence that she still works for an organization that has a CEO that has care and intent and isn't living in an ivory tower and isn't naked with no clothes, and that is my agenda at all times. And honestly, I don't judge myself. Like I'm prepared for my children to say they wish I was around more. And I'm also, but I'm also prepared for them to show me that I showed them a life of doing what you love so I taught them how to live. And that doesn't mean about money and if they go in nonprofit politics, sell, serving the public, whatever they may do, business, like, like I, I, I think lead by example matters. Yeah. So you know, and, and I think I got lucky that technology makes me connected more than ever. Um, and I can physically be there way, way, way more than my father was. So like, you know, like I, I, I think everyone's different. And I think you don't know. You have children that, I'm, this woman in the Philippines, I was at a conference, said something that blew my face off, which was like, she's like, you know, I used to resent my mother because she was like a judge and she worked her face off. And she's like, but then, like when I got older, like it's become the foundation of my happiness. 
She showed me I could be independent and have a child and I love her. And it spoke to me because the reason I don't fear working so much and potentially missing stuff when I'm 10,000 X more involved than my dad was is because my dad is one of the loves of my life. Yeah. We have a tremendous relationship on the flip side. I don't make the assumption that my kids are going to see it the same way. So I'm mentally, mentally prepared for them to be disappointed. Oh, brother. Wow. And by the way, one will be and one won't be. That's so cl- cliche, right? Like, and so like, I'm open to that. And I'm most open to adjusting. They're going to now be 11 and eight this summer. Like, well, maybe things change. And then by the way, things change when they get older. All of a sudden, you know, the only thing I think about is sitting courtside at Nick games with my son two times a week when he's 14, a New York City kid, grab an Uber, meet me at the garden and live life together. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like, and that wouldn't have happened. And not that you need courtside. Last row is great for me as well, back to the last story, but let's not get it twisted, especially where my life is. For my son at 13, when he's sitting there and Russell Westbrook comes over and gives him daps, he's going to be fired up and it's fun. Now, what I also have to do is make sure I don't buy him so they become spoiled as So he realizes like, cool, you want Russell Westbrook to fist bump your son or daughter? Then you better work. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 50 more amazing rules from David Goggins, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. So the first thing is, that's the first big problem right there. Mm -hmm. First big problem is that you have put a lot of people above you. Yeah. Put no one above you. Yeah. No one. Whatever you, but if, if, if you believe in something. Say that again.